Uh, next talk in schedule in Room Pa is the Face Dancer 2.0. It will be presented by Dominic Spiel and Kay Tamkin. Both are open source software developers, and this talk contains uh, device security around USB devices. So the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Give Perfect. them a warm applause, please. You may want to save that applause to see what kind of job we do first. Uh, so this is Face Dancer 2. Uh, I'm Dominic. Kate Emkin. It's not your name. Uh, and and this, is, this talks about USB. It's about uh, USB uh, spoofing, uh, hacking. We're going to do some sniffing. The idea is building USB devices and software. And um, let's get into it. So I think we're going to start off just by uh, thanking a number of people. Uh, this isn't all our own work. This is how we, we've built on other people's work. Um, starting from the top, Travis Goodspeed and Sergey for the original Face Dancer. Right, the two original developers of Face Dancer 1. Yep. Uh, Mike Osman, who is my boss and designed some of the hardware we're using. Um, Mike Elizabeth Scott, uh, also known as Scanlime. And um, she did some, thank you, person in the audience. Uh, and she did some amazing work with uh, Face Dancer a couple of months ago, which we mm -hmm. will we'll talk about. And then our employers, Assured Information Security, and Great Scott Gadgets, who are um, very indulgent for letting us come here and talk to you and spend time on these things. Yeah. All right. Anything else you want to add? No. All right. Uh, so it turns out USB is absolutely everywhere. See the map. Uh, lots of uh, USBs. Uh, so a couple of years ago, a guy called Josh Wright uh, came up with a concept that, that we're not going to improve the security of our devices, of our um, software and things like that, until it's really easy to attack the, uh, those systems. Um, I heard this described recently as, like, it's not a real attack until a script kiddie can run it. And someone else said, no, no, it's not a real attack until a journalist can run it. And I think it's the, same, it's the same idea. The better your tools are for attacking something, the more likely we are to fix the security because it's going to be more obvious that it's broken. Right. And so what we're actually building here is a USB attack tool, so a tool that you can use. We're not demoing exploits today, even though we have a couple that we'll show you kind of the periphery of. Our actual goal here is to show you a tool that we've built and enable you to use it. So you can actually pick this stuff up and start hacking on USB devices yourself. So. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think it's important to know. Like, we're not um, we're not developing these things to for because we have some great USB exploit. Like, I don't think any of our attacks are incredibly new, um, no. or at least not conceptually anyway. But but the idea is to make the tool easier and more accessible so that we can kind of multiply that that endeavor. We've only got a certain amount of time to play with USB, but if we make the tool easier for hundreds and possibly thousands of people to use, then we're going to see much better improvement in, uh, in USB security. Right. So when the original Face Dancer tool came out, that actually brought a lot of people out of the woodwork who were already attacking USB. Giving them the tools to do this really actually was, I think, what led to shoring up of the first USB stacks. Yeah. yeah. And we'll kind of go into the history in the talk. But the point here is that we are giving you the tools here to explore that attack surface, and by doing that, to do really cool things yourself. Yeah. All right. Uh, so I mean, I, I think we, uh, we've already described why we want to hack on USB. Um, uh, but it is absolutely everywhere. I think I, I counted recently, and there are more USB ports in my house than there are um, power outlets. You know, I, everything has a USB port on yeah, it these it's, days. It's surprising what has USB. My car has a USB port for firmware updates that's just sitting there in the center console. So it looks like it's a charging port, but it actually you can plug a flash drive in, update the firmware on the car. The right. controller, obviously, because reprogramming all the firmware has complete access to the CAN bus. And like, this is something that's probably running a shoddy Honda-ridden USB stack that they shoved into some Linux single board computer that's also on the infotainment system. It, exactly. I don't know if, you, if you've uh, looked at the version of the Linux kernel that runs on most, uh, most routers and car infrastructure and things like that, these, these embedded devices. But a lot of them are running old 2.6 kernels and things yeah. like that, things with known vulnerabilities in them. Uh, but there's no incentive to upgrade because, because we're not attacking them. Um, my television has a whole load of USB ports. And I think mm -hmm. it's manufactured by Samsung. And there was a, a report a couple of months ago of, of 
uh, those TVs being attacked, and one of the ways they were attacked was by plugging in a USB device to, to run a firmware update. Right, on and them. one of the wonderful things about the vendor ecosystem right now is you start off with kind of the core mainline Linux kernel, everyone forks it and starts building their special sauce on top of that, and so what you wind up with are televisions that have very old versions of the Linux kernel that are never being updated because now it's become too much of a pain for someone like Samsung to pull Linux patches into Tizen, which it, is their derivative Linux distribution. Exactly. They, they, they fork it at some point and add their own things, but don't, don't merge future changes and never merge back. Um, and so I, that's got security implications for us all. Right. And it's not like anyone's hanging smart TVs, right? So. Right. Exactly. <laughs> um, and this, uh, the photo on screen here is a, um, a little tool that we built a couple of years ago called Turnip School. Um, which, which is not specifically a, a USB hack, but it turns out we were able to build something into a USB connector. So here you can, you can see in the mold right before we, we squished in the, uh, the Sugru to turn it into a, what looked like a USB-A connector, and hidden inside that plug was a USB hub. So your cable still worked as if it was connected, your USB device was connected, but um, the hub also had a wireless microcontroller hanging off it that we controlled the firmware on remotely. Right, so the goal here is by enabling you to do these things, you can start really getting your foot in the door with embedded systems. So one of the use cases that I think is really cool was actually if you take our software and plug it into a USB port in something like your car, you can actually tell what version of the operating system that car is running. Because right. a lot of the individual steps that it does as it configures that USB device are specific to the implementation of USB. So by now having done USB for a few years, I can actually look at the list of steps that happen and say, oh, that's Windows. That's Linux. That's right. Linux before you know, 2009. And I think we'll come on to that as we describe how USB works, because we're, we're going to give it a very brief overview of, of the simplest high-level um, aspects that you need to know about, about how USB works as a, as a technology. Mm -hmm. Do you want to? Do you want to sure. this? So the, we're going to start off with a brief description of how USB works, I'm trying not to stray out of the video range here. But the question that most people ask themselves as they start wanting to hack something like USB is, how do I get into this? The spec is probably 500 pages if you're looking at USB 2, significantly longer if you're looking at super speed. There's a lot of documentation there. So how much do you really have to know in order to be able to start hacking USB? And the answer is not much. We can still hack USB without having a ton of background knowledge. Yeah, so, so I mean, this is exactly the face I would make if you asked me for specific details of the USB spec, because I've not read it. Um, and, and it turns out, as, as Carl said, it's, it's 500 pages. And to implement a device, you need maybe, what? 10 of them. 10, 20 of those pages at most. Uh, there's a lot of complexity in the host side. And so it seems like that would be where all the bugs are. And maybe it's worth trying to attack them. Yeah, and uh, so while you can definitely get better at attacking these things, if you're willing to spend time looking at the spec and do crazier and more progressive things, all the low-hanging fruit really requires you to know maybe 10 things about USB. Yeah. So we'll go over those. Let's, let's try and go over those, those 10. So USB came about because there were a lot of disparate various serial and parallel port technologies. USB was an attempt to unify them. I think it is the only attempt I've seen to unify things that has actually really worked. Yeah, I mean, it. People complain about USB every now and again to me, and I think those people clearly don't remember trying to get a serial mouse working and a parallel port printer, and then, you know... Install mouse.com. Yeah, and, exactly. And set up the IRQs. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, wow. That takes me back. Uh, and those, those weird little serial PS2 adapters to plug your one mouse into the other port, and oh. Yeah. It, it's just so nice to be able to, to buy a device and know that it plugs into almost anything, and it... I, I think it really, as a technology, I mean, I love USB. I'm, I'm not trying to attack it because I think it's bad. I'm trying to, I'm trying to attack it because I think it's interesting, it's prevalent, and it's, it's so useful. The idea that I can take a drive from one place and plug it in somewhere else and it, it just works, and, and so on and so forth, is, is a concept that was slightly alien in the 90s. Yeah, and, and uh, then, I mean, it's true that when you describe things as I love USB, people accuse you of having Stockholm Syndrome. It's yeah, an actual is, accusation that's that been is, it was my leveraged mistake. several times this week. But USB is really, really nice, especially compared to the old days where you'd plug something into a DB9 connector, you'd have all this stuff that you'd need to configure in order to have the communication work, like baud rate, which you'd need to kind of do as a user, and you need to know as a user, and you need to know how to do in order to actually get communication going. So USB was a 
attempt to take all of these various disparate ports and squish them down into just this port here. So just the yeah. USB port right in the center of that diagram. And again, it is dead simple if you're a device. Really, the whole goal of USB is to give you a protocol that lets you take bytes and squish them through a narrow single differential pair back and forth over a cable. And if you kind of take in the USB abstractions, it really does look like you are just moving bytes back and forth over a series of pipes. So just like you would be doing on kind of UART RS-232 level stuff, you can actually send bytes along USB one way and the other. And if that's what you want to do, it is actually pretty simple. The only constraint is that USB requires you to do some things in the vein of wanting of needing that standardization. So it does force you to do some initial setup in order to have a device plug in and nicely say, yes, I'm a HackRF. This is my vendor ID and product ID operating system. Here's a hint if you want to figure out what driver you should be using for me. And, and I think, like you were saying, you, when you had to plug in a, a serial port, you had to configure the board right. And the, there were how many, however many different hundreds of modes of parallel ports for, for printers. And you'd, you'd never get them quite right. Um, and, and things like that. And so USB standardized that in that it forces the device to, say, to initially say, here is my information, and here is how you configure me. And that gives, that gives us the ability to, to plug and play. And, yeah. um, and so that's, oh. no, that's fine. I, was, yeah. uh, I forgot which slide was next. Yeah. Uh, I, was, I was segueing into the wrong slide. Um, so, so the way it's broken down is you have the, these things called endpoints. And I guess, I guess it's, it's possible that you, if you think about a network connection between two places, um, thinking about that network connection having you know, ports, whatever, this is a little bit similar to that. Yeah, um, so, so if you imagine you have, you might have a network where you have five computers on each side and it's all narrowed down to a single wire in exactly. the middle. Those computers on either side are your endpoints. And USB conceptually has a very similar concept. An endpoint is a communications channel and the associated buffer and control hardware for that. So. I can have a USB device and want to do five or 10 different things on it. If you've ever plugged in a device that acts both as a mouse and a keyboard and a camera, like our projectors do, those kind of devices actually, it's nice to be able to have multiple communications channels multiplexed over that single USB line. So, or the single differential pair. I say single, but it is worth noting that it. USB 3, it is multiple. There's actually three differential pairs in USB 3, and technically power is also part of the USB spec, so hence the two with the asterisk. But for most of the USB stuff you will see, pretty much every device is piping all of its data over a single signal line that is actually represented as D plus and D minus. It's a single differential yeah. signal line. So what endpoints do is let you take all the different things that you might want to do with a device, configuration, bulk data transport, that equivalent of RS-232 where you're bulk spewing bytes from place to place, and endpoints are your conceptual abstraction on top of all the different ways you might multiplex them onto a single differential pair. Yeah, I've, I've actually just realized how slightly misleading this diagram is. Um, but, but you might have, quite often your keyboard, for example, have a pair of endpoints where they transfer um, your, your key presses in one direction and, and feedback for, um, for you know, the caps lock LEDs or whatever in, in the other direction. And then maybe that device also has a mouse, and that will appear as a second set of endpoints. That, that, um, and so quite often a pair of endpoints will map to a given to a given function of the device as well, which um, is right. slightly so, misleading in here. So if you were to extend this diagram out, you could actually have more than one function on a single device as well. It, yeah, so you can so have multi-function devices that appear as multiple devices yeah. and, and composite devices. The key here is that everything is grouped down into that one single differential pair one right. before you. So, so this, this image uh, credit, I don't know if the audience can see this because it's behind a wavy cat, but um, it's from Beyond Logic's uh, USB in a nutshell, which is a, an, a a website that kind of breaks down the things you need to know about USB. And that is, again, it's, the, it's like we were saying, the spec is 500 pages. You need about 10 of them. And uh, USB in a nutshell has done that. It's pretty much and that 10-page version. Yeah, I, I don't think I've, I've used any other resources. The other book that people recommend is USB Complete. Yep, and I've used that. Um, which I, I've not ever got around to reading, but I hear is really good for, for getting much deeper into this. But USB in a nutshell is everything you need if you're going to implement devices. So. Um, so there are four, four key types of endpoint uh, that changes in USB 3, but for USB 2 for now, it's, um, it's, it's true, and it's true for the vast majority of devices. Uh, an awful lot of devices out there will be a control endpoint and two bulk endpoints, one in either direction. Um, and that's, that's kind of how you hit those higher data rates with USB 2. And 
the, the idea is control is used for sending, configuring the device, sending data backs and forwards, for the device to tell the host, here are, here are all like, my functions, here's how I work, here is, um, here is my board rate, all that sort of thing. And, and any then, simple packetized configuration data. So yeah. control is your simple, I want to get some information that's very short, back and forth to a device or back to set it up, things like I want to turn the keyboard LEDs on. And it gives an opportunity for right. the device to provide standard information about itself. Yeah. It is the only transport that also specifies a packet format. The reason for that is that control endpoints are what is used for the basic discovery and enumeration. So when you plug a device in, your host can say, who are you? What are you doing here? And that control endpoint format is actually what is used to basically provide all of the descriptions of the device. And we'll get into that. Yeah, and, and I think. The, the, it's nice that it's, it's standardized. It means it's very simple to write code on either end that talks to it. So we use that in, for example, the HackerF control library to do things like set the frequency, um, turn on and off the amplifiers, and things like that, all those, all those kind of very short settings that you make. But then when you want to stream data at 480 megabits, you use the bulk endpoints because they are just an arbitrary buffer. And you say, here's some data. I'd like this to appear at the other end of this USB cable, please. Right. So and, and that's what the bulk, bulk uh, endpoints will do for you. Right. So those top two are most of the communications you have on most devices, control being your control signals, bulk being any of that real uh, long, uh, higher bandwidth data stream that you use to get the get things like disk contents back and forth. Interrupt and isochronous are much less used. Probably the exception is keyboards and mice which tend to use interrupt transfers, which are just transfers that tend to be shorter but have a bounded latency. And then isochronous is mostly used for things like webcams, where you don't actually care if you lose data. You just want the most recent data that's available. If you're hacking USB, probably the first two will get you 90% of the way there. So, Yeah, the first two are, are a significant number of devices will mm -hmm. just appear like that. In fact, we had a tool um, that I wrote a couple of years ago, which I will reference later, called USB proxy. But it turns out we only ever supported the first two types of endpoint, and um, people didn't notice for months because everything they tried to, they tried to hack on was, was one of those devices. Um, so I think we've already kind of covered this, but control requests are, are pretty simple. Again, this diagram comes from USB in a nutshell. Um, but they're, they're pretty simple. They have a predefined format, but then you just append a bunch of bytes to the end for, for kind of your user-defined stuff uh, for the, the blobs of data, but they, they have um, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? They have uh, some specific structure at the, up at the front end, so you can do things like request the descriptors from the device. Right, they have a packet format. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's, thank you. Um, and so I think we've mostly covered this slide. Yeah, I think the okay. only thing that's worth noting, and this is important if you're going to hack on USB, USB is almost a null-terminated protocol when you're talking setup, in that if you start sending packets, the way that it denotes the end of a transfer is by you sending a packet that has a length set that is less than its maximum. And that enables us to do some interesting stuff, because if you, for example, compromise a USB controller and start just having it read out all the contents of its memory, as long as you never send a packet that is less than maximum length, it will just continue. So this is a perfect analog for all of your string exploits, if you're using the C standard library ever, because you basically have what amounts to null termination. Also, people mess up null termination all the time, and we fixed null termination bugs in three USB stacks in the past two weeks, yeah. I believe, uh, that we found by doing this project. Um, so, and, then, and then over those, those control endpoints, we have enumeration. And enumeration is the way that the device says, um, tells, tells the host what it is. And the, the first thing the host does is say, give me your device descriptor. And the, the device says, I'm a hacker F. And then it says, OK, how do I communicate with you? What endpoints do you have? What configurations do you have? And it sends that data back in a, in a standardized format. And you'll have seen that used if you've ever used things like LSUSB or if you've ever gone into drill down into the device properties in Windows or anything like that. Right. So Those if you ever use Windows and you plug a device in and it makes that horrible sound, then tells you that there's a hacker if present and it's looking for a driver, what it has done is gone through the standardized pieces of the USB enumeration protocol in order to ask the device who it is, what's a description or a descriptor, that um, what is a binary block that describes what you do, who you are, your vendor and product ID, give me some strings that tell me how I can show the user who you are. All of those things are encapsulated in these standard binary blocks called descriptors. 
But as Carl was saying earlier, and as it says at the bottom of this slide, they do things differently. So I have, you have bugs where um, you know, the, my device works perfectly on Linux, but when I connect it to a Windows system, it just entirely fails to ever appear because they enumerate them in different ways. And we can actually use this to fingerprint the, uh, the operating system that's, that's talking to our device. We don't ever really need to communicate with them. We don't need to get down into the nitty-gritty of the driver. We can just use that initial uh, um, configuration section of the, of the host system to fingerprint which operating system it's using, which version of Windows, potentially. Um, we don't have very complete documentation on this yet. We haven't uh, gone through and kind of profiled them all, but I can certainly tell you the differences between but, different but couple of Linux systems and Windows. And if you look at the UMAP project, uh, they actually have a full library, which is based off the original Phase Dancer. They actually have a complete library of uh, essentially tricks that they use, presenting a bunch of virtual devices and seeing both how enumeration happens and how the operating system interacts with those devices. And they can tell you to a pretty good degree of granularity whether you're using Ubuntu, or an older Debian, or you've plugged this into a PlayStation, or you're using you know, Windows 2000 with the USB stack that was delivered in the service pack. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I almost I didn't, didn't initially have it. Uh, and then on top of, on top of this, we're, go we're kind of going up the layers of abstraction here. But there are these, uh, there are these things called classes, uh, which, which defines a specific kind of sub-device or, or interface on the device. So. You don't have to, again, if you remember those old days with your, your serial mouse, you plug in your serial mouse, and then that thing needs a driver. And if you're lucky, it uses the standard one. But in general, if you, if you bought the fancy looking mouse, it probably uses the ridiculous driver that you had to get on a floppy disk. And um, you have to install drivers to get those devices working in the first place. And that's still the case for a lot of USB devices, especially custom devices, more obscure devices. Um, Thing, things like HackerF, for example, we write all our own, our own host code. But if you're implementing a keyboard or a mouse and you comply to one of these classes, uh, any, any operating system that worth its salt will, will um, already have a driver that supports these standard methods. The same goes for serial There's, and storage. There's a reason I can take a USB stick from my laptop and plug it into my TV or plug it into uh, Carl's car or, um, or anything like that, and, and that is that that is predefined as part of the spec. And so um, those are some interesting devices because they appear almost everywhere. But again, their code was written by whoever implemented it on that operating system or whoever fought that, that kernel at that time and, and has kept all the bugs from uh, 10 years ago in their system. So they're kind of interesting places to go because you don't require there to be, you know, it's not a, if there's a vulnerability there, that vulnerability is not. If we're lucky, they have this obscure driver for this piece of hardware on their system. It's if there's a vulnerability in the way something handles mass storage, it affects every one of those devices because it's always present. And so that's that's kind of a, they're interesting to look at from that point of view. Um, it also makes them e much easier to implement because the, uh, they're very well defined um, as opposed to some other devices. Right, and one of the really nice things about having these levels of standardization is it also means that a lot of the implementation moves into these kind of interesting third-party libraries. And so if you find a vulnerability in a third-party USB library, there's a good chance that that is going to be reused in lots of different places. So for example, FreeBSD's drivers often are pulled from Linux. Right. So if you find a bug in the Linux USB stack dealing with, for example, human interface devices, then there's a good chance that that same implementation is going to be used in FreeBSD and other operating systems. And if you're like me, and you're tasked to write a USB stack for your custom operating system, the first thing you're going to be using as reference is the Linux kernel. So you'll actually have you know, gone and looked at this driver, because you know that's the one working implementation you were able to find, implement the same behavior, and chances are introduce the same bug. Right. Uh, two, so two other things, last points I'd like to make on this slide. One is uh, Kyle has added here next to human interface devices, data gloves. Uh, if you read the human interface device um, spec that the USB stand, uh, group published, you'll find that they were incredibly 90s about it and incredibly optimistic about the fact that data gloves were going to be the thing that we're all using to interact with computers. And it's, it's interesting because the spec talks about touch screens, and they were like absolutely right that everyone was going to be using a touch screen in a few years. But they also talk an awful lot in their examples about data gloves and the idea that I'd have some glove where I'm, you know, I'm interfacing with, the, with my hands. Uh, and it's, I don't know, it's, it, it's a more optimistic time. Uh, and the I other actually, one, it's actually pretty amazing because they were really far looking when they designed the HID specs. And that's the reason why you have all these fancy multi touch controllers and they still work with that same spec. 
they were able to come up with a protocol that was configurable enough that you could do all kinds of crazy and wonderful things. And not just did they have basic descriptions of how you might do them for things like touchscreens, they also made the protocol flexible enough that it, it could self-describe new types of devices. So if you've ever seen something that identifies as a human interface device that is not something you would think of as a normal human interface device, like I think some of the Teensy bootloaders and like microcontroller bootloaders do this, just yeah. because if they say they're a human interface device, they know that an operating system is going to have a driver that's not going to do much with them, but they can actually still kind of pipe data over that. And Anytime I say that there's something that's kind of a complex self-describing description, the first thing you should be thinking is that there's probably a shotgun parser that is sitting there behind the scenes that someone you know, wrote at the last minute saying, I need to parse this complex binary data format. And if you've ever really tried to fuzz parsers, you'll know that they're not, they're probably one of the weaker pieces of most modern software. So yeah. if you're gonna find vulnerabilities, you should be looking for complex things like ASN.1 or human interface device descriptors. Yeah. We, we should be a little bit careful criticizing shotgun parsers because I wrote one two days ago for this project. And I criticized it. Uh, yeah, and it, it, it does make some really big assumptions that you're behaving yourself. Uh, our USB man in the middle tool makes some assumptions that you're going to behave yourself uh, while talking to it, but use it for malicious things, which is, um, I mean, it, it will happily fuzz itself and, and fail. Um, so, I mean, that's, I guess that's dog fooding. Uh, the other one here is networking, I think is important to note, because there was an, an interesting case a couple of uh, months ago, earlier this year, last year, where, um, oh, I've completely forgotten who it was, M Mubix, uh, Rob Fuller, um, did um, something where, where he plugged a net USB networking device into a Windows host, and because it appears as an Ethernet device, it takes priority over the wireless connection that it already had. The machine was still locked, and he was able to um, extract all sorts of information about the networking system, um, networking stat from the locked Windows machine because he was able to increase his network priority over the existing connection um, and, and do some interesting, it made some right. automatic so, proxy requests and things like that. Right, because USB is kind of in this weird trust position where it's a, both a user-facing port that you would not expect to have a lot of power, but it's also viewed as something that the kernel is commonly interfacing with. There's a lot of interesting trust boundaries that have not quite been drawn correctly with regards to USB. So if yeah. you go and plug a USB network interface card in, there's a lot of trust on the host's part that this is a real network interface card that is not trying to attack your device. So if you're sitting there with a locked PC, you can still plug in that card. It will enumerate. It'll load the network drivers. The network can say, hey, by the way, I happen to have the correct routing to route literally every packet on the system. And then every packet you have from that point forward will start going through your custom USB device. And so what was actually done in this attack was that lots of things were proxied through that connection, and including things that normally probably would have been done over HTTPS, but if you haven't seen that particular connection before, and you don't accept the SSL only, right? Cookie, and then and exactly, and and he, yeah, I believe he served up a, a, a sort of proxy config file, yep. and the host just took it and, and accepted it. And my, I mean, ev lots of things do this. My my laptop's running Ubuntu at the moment, and if I plug in a USB network card, it will automatically uh, enumerate the device, load the network stack, grab an IP address, and and go out there and probably advertise itself using uh, all that that zero comp stuff that I mm -hmm. should have disabled by now. Yep, and this is all enabled entirely by something that is capable of acting as a network device that's not entirely designed in good faith. So if you have something yeah. that lets you really easily write a network device, you can start doing this kind of attack really easily. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, show off real USB device. Yeah, LSUSB, the heck are The implication there being that the devices that we create are not real. Oh, yeah, uh, I get you now. I got you. Uh, so, I mean, I, I assume most people have seen LSUSB before. If I run LSUSB, it shows me the devices hooked up to my system. Um, OpenMoco, uh, I, I believe a lot of people are probably familiar with the existence of the phones a few years ago. At some point, they, they ceased uh, building USB devices and said, well, I mean, we've got this, this vendor ID we paid for. Uh, if anyone making open source hardware wants a free product ID so they can um, have a unique identifier when they connect to um, for their for their product, uh, we'll start giving them out. So you just email them and ask really nicely, and they come back to you and give you a, a USB ID, um, and and that enables us to kind of much more easily differentiate and, and talk to these things without paying thousands of dollars for a, a license, uh, so for a vendor ID from the USB 
spec for our four devices that we make or something. Yep, so if you want to just do like a VVM, one of those devices, we can show you. This is all the information that the USB device provides in standard format to the host. So we have the vendor ID and product ID, which are encapsulated in there. We have strings that describe the device. And we actually have these configurations, which are a description of how the device plans to be used, which is absolutely fantastic, because you were talking about configuration difficulties 20 years ago. Exactly. But like last week, if you had a USB to serial adapter and you were also running something like Debian that comes with Modem Manager, it'll just pick that up and start spamming whatever data it wants into there because of the vague possibility that there's a modem on the other side. Yeah. There are some interesting things in here. For example, we can tell the host how much power we want. Um, now, uh, for USB 2, you're only going to get 500 milliamps uh, maximum from a, from a host um, that's enumerating you in, in, with these descriptors. But that dynamic changes when it comes to USB-C. We're not looking at USB-C right now. Um, we're not looking at USB 3.0. But there's a lot more power uh, available and a lot more power delivery available to people to, uh, to do interesting things. And that's, that's definitely on our to-do list. And then lower down, we come down to these, these endpoints we were talking about before. Um, they have a direction. They have a size. They have a, a max packet size. Um, and so we can, from this, kind of approximate that actually this is a USB 2 device. Um, this is, it's got bulk endpoints that are 512 bytes. Uh, and it's going to try and transfer a reasonable amount of high rate data. But it's got none of those uh, isochronous or interrupt endpoints that are used for things like the human interface device and, and so on and so right. forth. So you can see the HackRF here just uses two bulk endpoints and the control endpoint that every device has. Those are just two data pipes that are used to spew samples back and forth from the HackRF to the computer. Yeah. And apparently, my device status is in debug mode, which is not a mode I've ever read about. <laughs> so. Uh, that's worrying. Yeah. Uh, so face answer um, a really a really brief history because uh, I think we spent long enough talking about uh, you know the internals of USB and, and things like this. But we just want to give some credit to, to Sergey and Travis. So, um, yeah. I so mean, this this started with Travis, Sergey, and a bottle of whiskey, as, as I understand it. And the discussion was there's a software tool, tool called libusb that lets you really easily talk to USB devices. And that's fantastic if you want to start fuzzing USB devices. But nothing existed that would let you fuzz USB hosts. So there was no easy equivalent. Right. So uh, you know, a bottle of whiskey and some prototyping later, Travis had taken his good FET, which was a microcontroller board, and taken an SPI-based USB controller, hooked it up to that, and created a USB-controlled USB controller, which was the very first face dancer. And so this board is actually, if you were to cut it off here, this is a good FET. And then they just kind of stuck on this tiny USB chip, which enables them to talk to other hosts and basically act as a USB device on one end and a USB device on the other. So it is a USB-controlled USB device. Yeah. Yeah, and actually, uh, this is, uh, Travis's design for this thing is, is incredibly simple and, and very smart in that on the left-hand end there, it's an FTDI device. It, it comes up, again, it makes use of the fact that a bunch of uh, operating systems know how to speak to, to a, a USB serial device. And so you don't need a, a strange um, driver or anything to program this thing. You can plug it in, and it will immediately work. You then use that serial connection to program the MSP430 in the middle to speak SPY. And then it speaks SPY over, over the next couple of uh, traces to the, the USB device chip. And the USB device chip is a part that was designed to go into USB devices. So if you're trying to spoof a USB device using the same hardware that real USB devices use is a pretty smart way to do it. You have the same capabilities as an awful lot of devices out there. Now, this board was incredibly limited in terms of um, its compliance with the USB spec. There are an awful lot of things that USB allows that this board does not allow. But it turns out it doesn't really matter because it was able to spoof so many different devices. The, the majority of those really basic class devices, it's able to, to spoof and, and act as. And, um, that gives us the opportunity to, to do some interesting attacks. Right, and that's, that's really a testament to the flexibility of USB, that we had this right. simple device here, which actually did not support everything you could do with USB. It had only four fixed type endpoints, of which one was the control endpoint, mm -hmm. one was an in, one was an out, and then one was configurable. And just using those four endpoints and those four data types, the USB spec actually allows enough reconfigurability that Travis was able to create USB mice, USB keyboards, FTDI emulators, USB to serial emulators in the USB consumer device control class. This was enough that we could actually emulate 
a pretty huge subset of devices. But if you wanted to go and emulate a vendor device, or you wanted to take like a, a device that you had personally found and were interested in fuzzing the software for, the fixed type endpoints meant that you were never going to be able to create a complete reproduction of that device unless you happen to have stumbled upon exactly the four endpoints that the device was already pre-configured to use. Right. If it, one of the things this would be great for is emulating devices that already are based on the Max 3421E part. But if your device is based on something else and uses a slightly different configuration that part didn't, uh, didn't provide, then uh, it wasn't going uh, to help you out there. And so what we wanted to do was look at other options for speaking uh, USB, but with more flexible configuration, more flexible configuration controllers. So we have the Face Dancer 2 project, which probably needs a better name. But um, uh, mostly because it gets confused with one of Travis's. So there was a Face Dancer 20 board. If you look at this board, the number is Face Dancer 21. The previous one of that was Face Dancer 20. And we actually were literally describing this to someone and they said, why the heck would I use Face Dancer 2 when Face Dancer 21 is out? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was so, yep. uh, you know, there's only, yeah. you know, we're, we're not only, bitter about that hack right, rejection at all. There's, um, there's only two hard problems yeah. in InfoSec, right? Naming things, cache invalidation, and off by one oh, errors. Yep. So, and and we, yeah, we had two of those things. Uh, so, so we spot a load of different backends. And in fact, we, are, we were up at the Munich CCC group uh, the other day and talking to them about the radio badge from, um, from Camp 2015. And they said, oh, we've got two USB ports and, and an interesting control, uh, USB controller on there. And we said, oh, yeah, that looks an awful lot like GreatFit. Yeah, that shouldn't take us too long. So, so the next thing is, if you have one of those badges from 2015, it will support the attacks we're about to do uh, as soon as we get around to writing the software. Right. So, so, so you don't. So, I, <laughs> so for those of you who regularly attend these camps, you're in luck. You don't have to yeah. go and buy any hardware. You already have it. Uh, and for those who didn't attend uh, Camp 2015, I'm really sorry because that badge was amazing. Yeah. And if uh, we don't get the you in like. A few months, someone email me and just tell me I should do that. Yeah, just, 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 just push it back us. up to the top of the priority you, queue. You, you can find our Twitter handles and just bug us every day until we, until, well, until Kyle writes it. Until we block you. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> until we block you. Um, but it already works with, with Face Dancer, um, Ross Dancer, and Beagle Dancer. Ross Dancer was um, someone called Philip, uh, Philip Tuen. Uh, I've probably just completely murdered his name. Um, but he, uh, he saw that the, um, the, there's, a, there's a choke point in, in the way that Face Dancer works, and so you um, you can't support like higher speed devices, and you can't support, and not even higher speed devices, but like reasonable data rate devices. Incredibly slow. Right. So if you look at this guy, because everything is going through this FGDI USB to serial chip, it's limited to the baud rates that an FTDI chip can reasonably do, which in this case was something like 15k baud. Yeah, it's, it's in this particular implementation. It, yeah, um, and and so what he does then is just said, well, it's the chip speaks spy, I can just plug it into a Raspberry Pi. And I said, oh, the chip speaks spy, I can plug it into a BeagleBone because I like open source hardware. And um, so that's how these, these, two, these two boards on the, on the bottom left hand side, of the, on the right hand side of the screen uh, exist. And then at the top right, there is, a, there is GreatFet, and that's what we'll be running our demos on today. GreatFet is a board that um, we've been building at Great Scott Gadgets that um, gives us the, it, it's Imagine uh, it's the microcontroller section of the, the Hacker F. And so if you have the radio badge from 2015, it's the microcontroller section on that too, which is why it's so simple to, um, to port that code across to the radio badge. Right. But this is basically a USB Swiss Army knife. It's in the same vein as GoodFet. It's, yeah, it's got. It's literally, I mean, I'm pretty sure Travis sold that to Mike. Oh, for, yeah, that's sorry. I'm sorry. I, I completely <laughs> forgot. That. Yeah, so it turns out we keep referring to Travis Goodspeed's GoodFet project. It's actually a Great Scott Gadget's GoodFet project because we bought it for him for five bucks. Um, and, and I believe. Over he, drinks. Oh, yeah, I believe he tried to buy it back, um, but did not. Uh, we, we, we refused. The price went up. So, um, but GreatFet is our, our kind of next generation USB Swiss Army knife hardware hacking tool. It supports all sorts of things or interesting protocols for, for playing around with hardware. Um, we've given talks about it in the past, and I'm sure we'll continue to do so and have examples up there. So, if you go and look up the GreatFet project, there's some, there's some interesting stuff happening there. But, but it's important to note that. Um, We've put a reasonable amount of effort into making sure that the Face Dancer 2 code works with other hardware. So you don't have to have that hardware, um, but I like it a lot. Um, yeah, so we're not just trying to sell you this. It works on lots of variety of other things. Yeah. We use this because it's easy. So if you want easy, that's right, an option. Exactly. Other than that, but it's probably going to be as easy on the radio badge. So yeah, same thing. Um, and, and it's feasible that this will work. Uh, something that happened when I, I 
built this Beagle Dancer board at the bottom. This is the only working Beagle Dancer because it turns out the conversation went, hey, I've designed this thing that will do a uh, face dancer but attached to the Beagle Bone. And um, my boss Mike said, but it's got two USB ports. It's got a USB host and USB device port. Can't you just implement the same thing in software? And so then I spent a bunch of time implementing it in software and never bothered soldering up the second uh, Beagle Dancer board because building this thing is, is, is vaguely pointless when the, the, hardware, the only hardware it connects to supports the same functions without having to build any hardware. Right. So the goal is that eventually we'll be able to take things like the RPi Zero, which is the $5 version of the Raspberry Pi, exactly. and be able to do all the same face dancer stuff on that. It's a little bit messy in that we have to work with we have to basically write kernel drivers for that. But the hope is that if we do that at the right level of abstraction, that will work on literally any Linux single board computer that yep. has device support. So anything that's OTG, anything that has just a device port, should be able to act as a face dancer device. Yeah. So that will be the ultimate in cheap, because I don't think anything you build is going to get down to like $5. Yeah, so we just don't exactly. have the Raspberry Pi volume. Exactly. So, so, so let's, uh, we actually need to pick up the pace a little bit, because uh, we've mm -hmm. waffled on about USB for such a long time. And I want to show some demos. So, um, so the, additional, the additional features, um, the, the beauty of like, removing those limitations from the, the come with the, fa the original Face Dancer platform is that we're now able to emulate different devices, uh, more complicated devices, those different configurations that aren't limited to the endpoints that that chip supports. So we can use uh, much more flexible um, configurations of endpoints and things like that in the, uh, in the, uh, using the Great Fet. Um, and we're also able to man in the middle, uh, perform man in the middle attacks on um, USB connections. Now, this is the thing I did um, previously with the, the BeagleBone Black, but um, I'm able to, we're able to do it with, with uh, new face dancer now, and it's a lot simpler, and uh, we're going to show a demo of that in a minute as well. Um, so what can we do with face dancer? We can continue to do the same things the original face dancer was commonly used for. We can fuzz USB hosts, which means that if you have something like a PlayStation that has a older or custom USB stack, we can start attacking that USB stack. And you'd be surprised how quickly and easily these things fall over. I used to say that this was true mostly for custom USB stacks. But in development of the USB proxy stuff that we were doing here at camp this week, I think we managed to lock up your laptop reliably, find codes that reliably would. Yeah, this thing's running a 4.10 kernel. And we have a pretty reliable piece of code that I accidentally wrote that will uh, lock this thing up. So I have to hard, hard reboot it. Right, and we weren't even trying to fuzz. We were just trying to get USB working, yeah, which, I was which to, shows to actually that getting us, code. getting us to develop software for you is a great way of having everything yeah, fuzzed. Yeah. And uh, yeah, someone, uh, someone recently said to me, oh, Face Dancer 2? Yeah. W I mean, as long as it will still reliably uh, crash my PlayStation, I'll, I'll <laughs> use it. And so that's, that's apparently what they wanted the original Face Dancer for. Right. We already discussed fingerprinting USB implementations. We did. And, and, and so it, again, going back to those classes of device, um, there are already, there's already code to implement those uh, in Face Dancer and because the old Face Dancer. And it was just a simple port to the new Face Dancer uh, when we wrote it to enable those things to, to exist. So we already have implementations for speaking of keyboard, a, a serial device, an FTDI device, which is right. slightly different. And if you look devices. at Travis's blog, there's actually great things on like stealing USB device firmware by pretending to be that device and asking for firmware updates, yeah. which is a cool technique. So it's, this is all super easy to use. We'll actually show you the code for a USB to serial converter. And you can see how easy it would be to take our library, our kind of back-end library and technology here, and build a USB to serial converter on top of that. I realized my, my font size was wrong in the, uh, in the terminal. Did you open so in Visual Studio Code? Yeah, I, I did. <sighs> Judging you. So yeah, you're right to judge me for it. OK, so the USB, the USB serial device lets, um, wow, how do I increase my font size? There it is. So, so essentially, you start off by importing a load of things from Face Dancer to configure the various sections of a um, of those con those requests, uh, those descriptors. So um, all the standard stuff we do already. That's, yeah. you just pull you, it in, cancel it. You specify a couple of endpoints. That's the data we're going to transfer in each direction. Control endpoints always going to be there. You describe the device, which basically is the endpoints. Uh, sorry, the endpoints. The descriptors are an empty dictionary. Yeah, for some reason. Uh, and, we don't have and any custom descriptors. Oh, yeah. The rest are go. here. And, and these, oh, wow. I'm, I'm not good at interfacing with an editor, as uh, anyone who's ever written software with me will know. Uh, these, these bytes here just say, hey, we're custom. We don't, we don't uh, conform to, um, to, a, to a spec at the interface level. Right, so that's all the, comp the 
data that USB is going to ask for in order to enumerate the device. So, so that is all the boilerplate that's yeah, specified so by all, the USB spec. All of that so far is boilerplate. You can, you can pick up this file and copy and paste it. In fact, that's how the USB proxy encode works. I took this file, copied and pasted it, and just altered the bits and, I needed yeah. to. And from here to here, that yeah. is the actual implementation of the device. Right. So, so that is everything that's not already boilerplate. So, so when data is available over this serial connection, we uh, remap the, uh, the carriage returns, we uppercase the data, and we send it back. So literally, um, USB is serial, data comes in on one bulk endpoint. We take it, do whatever we want with it, and send it back on the other endpoint. This basically has an endpoint for send, an endpoint for receive. Our whole emulation code is so simple, both because the devices are simple and because our library makes it super simple, that if you were to play code golf, I think you'd get this down to two lines and still have it be reasonably readable. Yeah. So it is that easy to implement USB devices. So, so why don't we attempt to run it? Yeah. Face dance is serial. So face dance serial is just a wrapper script that sets it up and makes sure it finds a great FET rather than something else. Um, Travis, having used a, an FTDI device on the uh, original face dancer impl implementation, means that every time I have a face dancer plugged into my laptop, uh, our code tries to use that and gets really confused when it's connected to something else uh, and not a face dancer. But if I just run this, yeah, so again, because he was using legacy serial, exactly, no enumeration. So so what I've done is I've, I've run this thing against, uh, against my own laptop. Um, I, I don't have a second target device here. So I, I mean, this thing's just plugged in to two different USB ports. So what I do is I communicate with it over one. I say, hey, spoof a serial device. And the other port suddenly sees that there's a serial device. So if I just ls, uh, LS USB, you'll see a Hewlett Packard, which is it <laughs> claims to be a Hewlett Packard calculator. Classic Travis. Yeah. Um, and if I ls slash dev, you will see that I suddenly have TTY USB zero. TTY USB zero here, which which suddenly exists. And you can actually see exactly just just like we were talking about. This is modem manager saying, "Hey, there's a serial port here. Let me try sending it data." Yeah. You can see the face tester response. So, so over here, this is this is the log of what's going on. This this is what's coming from the host that we're targeting. And the first thing my host does when it sees this thing is you know, start trying to talk to it as if it's a, a serial device and if there's a, a, yeah. a modem or something there. And it's sending AT commands at every possible baud rate it can. Yeah, exactly. So it, try, it tries doing those. And obviously, they all work because we don't have to care about baud rates anymore in quite the same way, because we're never talking over a real serial link. Um, and I could do, uh, I could do a, a quick demo and do sudo screen slash dev slash TTY USB 0. And then if I start typing, if I type lowercase, it will just respond with the uppercase version. And that's going out over a fake serial link come to a bit of Python code and coming back. So I type that. You can see on the right-hand side, I typed it lowercase. It comes back as uppercase because it just goes through that function. And so now I can do that with any, anything that the, any uh, serial device, any uh, driver that talks to a serial device on a host system. I'm now able to have the, anything it speaks go through that function on my attack system, and I can do whatever I like with it. I can pretend to be a modem. I can pretend I'm a real device that they want to talk to. I can pretend I'm a device that they have a, what I know is a sketchy driver for, or something along those lines. Like If I know that there's a bad driver that tries to talk serial, I can just pretend I'm that device. Right, and extending out from serial, we can do literally anything that USB talks um, down to, we could be serial devices, we can be flash drives. And one of the cool things about USB being this transport layer for a lot of other different things is that we can start attacking SCSI devices because USB attached SCSI is a thing. So we have, you want to attack the system SCSI stack? Sure, you have an in to do that without building a whole other piece of hardware. Yep. We emulate everything at the transport level and you can do whatever you want. So yeah. we can obviously emulate devices and we can behave really nicely, which we do sometimes, I've heard. But we can also do things that are complete violations of the host's expectations. So here we have a kind of fundamental assumption that if I have a disk that's just sitting there and I'm not doing any writes to it, that its contents are not going to change. So most systems assume that disk containers don't change on this contents don't change on their own, but in practice, they totally can. And what that means is that on most embedded systems, which don't have enough memory to store a whole firmware update, but which actually do their firmware updates over USB. The way they do that, they read the whole firmware back, check to make sure that all the signatures pass, say, OK, I'm going to continue. This looks good. And then after they've done that, they reread it from the disk and flash it to ROM. 
most of you probably can already see the problem if we have complete control over the USB device, because now it's trivial for us to do things like take that device, provide the correct firmware the first time, and then provide our modified firmware the second time. And if you want to go to the next slide before we do the demo, yep. we have some great tweets. Oh, yeah. So it turns out this, this attack works pretty reliably against a full-size office photocopier. But uh, Shah was not entirely enthusiastic about us bringing one to a field, uh, especially we didn't really have a plan to get it here, and we had even less of a plan to get it away. Uh, and so, OSHA was not super happy about me vaporizing it. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so so um, it turns out you can't get one of those things in your hand luggage on an international flight. So we, we're going to have to demo this against my laptop in a really uh, silly cheesy, silly way instead, because uh, we couldn't just wheel on a giant photocopier and show that we can like do the update. But I promise you, it does work against a, uh, I mean, if you think of a photocopier brand, that's the one that it works against. Yeah, and we, and yeah, we found photocopiers, projectors, all kinds of things that meet that criteria of not having very much memory, totally vulnerable to this. Cool. Uh, wait, I have to do the thing. Yeah, it turns out. I'm not good at computers, um, so this is just going to take me a minute. Oh, wow. Oh, Type clear. Yeah. All right, all right, all right. OK, so what, I'm doing, control what I'm doing on the right-hand side is I'm running the um, double, uh, double fetch script that does exactly what um, we, we just described. We give it two files. It serves up the first one from the first read, and then all subsequent reads, it serves up the second one. Uh, what I've done up here on the top left is I've just disabled my disk caching, um, but it's OK. You're going to have to run that again between the two of them. Oh, yeah, yeah. thanks. Yeah. Uh, so I run it once. Now suddenly we have a USB drive. Linux is saying, hey, let me try to figure out what you are so it can auto-mount. Right. And then I'm going to try and mount it when it, when it finally gets there. Dev slash SD. Come on. I feel free to talk amongst This is also a great way to figure out who you are talking to in terms of operating system, because each of the operating systems has a different thing when you plug a disk in. Linux, if you have the user lens stack set up for auto-mounting, for example, if you're using uh, most of the desktop window managers, actually goes and reads a whole bunch of sectors right off the disk in order to try to figure out what file system is on there. So here, I've been looking at things that take USB flash drives and say, hey, this thing's got a custom USB stack because I don't recognize any of the access patterns on the disk. So we looked so at the file the first time. <laughs> There's the second. I mean, uh, given the round of applause, I assume everyone understands what just happened. But so, uh, I was able to calculate a, the check some of the files, the same file twice. I, admittedly, on this system, I had to drop my disk caches in between because it's, it's a, a much it's more a complicated system. That's not the case, obviously, with, um, with things like embedded devices, because like, the whole point is that they don't have enough memory to cache this thing. Um, and so that's why they're reading it twice. Cool. You want to jump to a proxy demo? Yeah. Do you want to just go straight yeah. for it? Yeah. OK. Um, tight on time. Dum, 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 dum. Uh, so wait. the next thing we can do, which is really cool, is proxy USB commands through our face dancer interface, which means you can plug a USB device into the host and have the face dancer act like a proxy for that same device. Exactly the same thing you do on most network connections, where once you have that proxy in place, you can do really nasty things, except there's no such thing as a certificate validating the USB device. That trust boundary is just out here in the middle of nowhere. And yeah. So you can entirely can emulate these devices, do whatever you want. If you don't want to have to write a full emulation layer for a disk in order to be able to change the data, you can write a really simple filter driver that sits in line, waits until it sees a certain data packet, modifies just that packet, and continues. So, so what we're going to do now is uh, I have a HackerF uh, hooked up. As you can see on the left-hand side, that's the information about the HackerF. I'm not going to attach any more devices. I don't have a second HackerF up here. I'm going to run the face dancer USB proxy. I give it HackerF's uh, USB identifiers uh, so it knows to pick it up. It just talks to it via LSUSB. It doesn't need a driver for it. It doesn't need to Live care. USB. What did I say? LSUSB. Same thing. Uh, I, um, it doesn't have to. Um, care about uh, a driver for it or anything like that, it can use libUSB to generically talk to the endpoints um, and, and then proxy them through, um, through GreatFet here and using FaceDancer and generate those endpoints at the other end. So oh, I should hit return the right window. So it's going to do that. The enumeration has hopefully happened. Uh, you, you can ignore messages that say fail. Nothing has actually failed. We just That's our note to ourselves that we want to do something there later. But, but in, now I should see 
that instead of just having one hacker ref hooked up to my system, I, my system should think it has two hacker refs hooked up. And you'll notice it does. The other thing is you'll notice that I was able to, on the fly, change the firmware revision to still hacker ref anyway. Um, <laughs> That demo is exclusive for you because I wrote it at 2 o'clock this morning. Uh, but you'll see the, uh, wow, I'm in completely the wrong file. Yeah, you are. I'm a professional. It's all right. You see, this is, this is our filter. This is the filter that makes that change happen. And all it does is have a string, encodes it to UTF-8, and then puts that back into the packet. So it takes a packet that is, is our vendor request to get the firmware revision, and takes the data from it, throws it away, and then puts the, uh, the, the new data in there instead. So with that allows us to modify things on the fly. It's also going to allow us to do, um, <laughs> you're welcome. Yeah, I, I was going to skip over a couple. Yeah. Really sorry, we're going to have to uh, skip over ScanLime's uh, demo. Um, but we'll show it off at TorCon. We'll show it off at TorCon, and we'll also uh, show anyone outside in the field afterwards. Um, just to clarify, USB proxy lets us access the data on the fly, so we can log that data. So we can do things like log to PCAP. Um, I could pull up Wireshark now as we're enumerating this device, and I could have my target Windows system with a, a completely closed source driver that I can't access, and I can have that USB device plugged into my machine, and I can proxy that traffic through my laptop, at which point I can just use the USB mon that already exists on Linux to get those packets in Wireshark and go and reverse engineer that driver. And the really cool thing about that is, unlike most of the software solutions that do similar things, you do not need to control the USB host. So you can, exactly. so unlike something that works as a kernel module, we can actually plug one of our ends into a PlayStation plug a flash drive into the other end, and then be monitoring the communications that that flash drive communicates with the, a PlayStation, which is something you wouldn't be able to do just by right. manipulating the, things in the Linux the kernel. The four things that I know this code has been previously used for, the old version of USB proxy has been used for, are uh, point of sale systems. Somewhere in the world, there's a regulatory requirement for something to do with USB devices hooked up to point of sale systems. And someone emails me about it once a month. Um, and, and, and what they want to do is, is perform this attack on a point of sale between a, a, a point of sale system and the receipt printer. Um, and then the other three times I know it's been used have been reverse engineering uh, game console controllers for um, the Wii U, for the PlayStation 3, and for the Xbox um, 360. And in fact, for Xbox 360, we went further than, than just reverse engineering and, and kind of dumping that information, and we were able to inject things. So we made a little device that when you hit a, uh, a little button on it, it would inject a series of key presses. So you could do some kind of power move in whatever game you're playing, as long as you have a um, device in line between you and, the, uh, you and the other end. And this enabled a friend of mine to cheat at games while playing with his friends. Um, and so like, that's really where this project comes from. Uh, so that would have been our man in the middle demo, which you just saw. Yeah. So the things that are coming up, we need to get it working on the radio badge. We need to get it working on um, systems that have an embedded um, Linux distribution. Yeah, Linux distribution with embedded device controller. Um, oh, make yeah. My printer has a host port and a device port, so I'm pretty certain I could use my printer as a as a um, right. face dancer. So you were just one printer exploit away from if you take over the Linux kernel on your printer, it could be a face dancer too. Yeah. And nicely, because I've already got a great fit, I can fuzz my printer to try and find that exploit to turn it into a face dancer to fuzz other printers. Right, so if you get a face dancer, you can get a right. face dancer. So yeah, it's easy to get root once you've got root. Uh, <laughs> so we want to look at power delivery, especially over USB-C. There's a lot more power available there, and you can do some pretty nasty things. And the power hopefully. delivery protocol is a whole new frontier for USB. There's actually some reasonably complex parsing that is done yep. to enumerate power delivery yep, client devices. Like a plaza. And then I think one of the coolest things that there, that if you search that has been done with uh, Face Dancer Technologies is Micah Scott's uh, Face Whisper, which was a, she built a derivative board based off the original Face Dancer that was actually capable of repeatedly requesting enumeration from various devices as she glitched their VCC. And because of that null termination issue we were talking about earlier, one of the things that would happen if she interrupted the DMA just the right time is that the controller would actually say, oh, I'm not supposed to stop now. Let me just keep reading memory forever. And so the DMA would continue past the descriptor, which is usually what was being transferred, onto the rest of the firmware. And so she was able to basically, and because USB is null terminated, it never ends. She was able to extract the firmware from a variety of USB devices, including a Wacom tablet, just by sitting there on the USB bus, controlling enumeration and also power glitching. She has a video on that in YouTube if you search for 
I think USB glitching scan line that'll yeah, come up. I think that's right. Uh, so here are the links to the project. Uh, Great Fair Experimental is just the is the firmware you require on the Great Fair if you are lucky enough to have one uh, at this stage. I uh, don't know when they're coming out. Uh, Face Dancer is the code um, to, to kind of make all this USB stuff happen. Right. Everything we've done so far is already up on GitHub. Yeah, so we, we've released it, everything already like months it's ago. It's already so. publicly available. Uh, I think we're about to be thrown off stage because yeah. we don't have enough time. But we will absolutely take questions uh, just outside the the stage afterwards if there's not time to take them now. And yeah, indeed. There's about one minute for questions. Perfect. So Very quick question. Just Why one. Python can I do the same in C instead of using Python? So you, the original USB proxy was written in C, uh, designed to run an ARM core. The reason uh, we use Python is because it means that I can write it in um, like three lines and not really have to worry about all that other stuff. But there's no reason you couldn't. It's just the original face dance code was in Python, and we kept going from there. Right. So the, so two of our nice. goals oh, okay. are that we want to be able to do USB hacking really quickly. So this is more of a prototyping thing than something you would actually build a product off of. So Python, really great for developing quick code. And two, it's multi-platform a lot more easily than C is. So a lot of our users but, don't want to be bothered compiling things. Right. But you can absolutely, it would be feasible to write these things in C if you wanted you to. There's, want to. There's, there's no reason you can't re-implement this in C. Um, because it's all, you can talk to the USB device, and you can look at that API, which is in the face dancer code, and re-implement it in C if you'd like. All right, we'll take other questions outside if there are any. And thank you very much for being patient. Thank you very much. That goes to the session.